learning strategy together. This correlates with slides six through eight. I'll put that there as a reminder on the PowerPoint presentation for oxygenation. So on a piece of paper, you should have three things listed. I want you to write down integrity of the airway system, properly functioning alveolar system, and properly functioning CV hematologic system, okay? Now the first thing we are going to do is talk about what could affect each of these things. What could affect each of these things? So let's jot down some together, okay? Let's brainstorm and think about what could possibly affect the integrity of the airway system. Now remember, your airway system starts right here at the end of your nose, goes to the oral and nasopharyngeal cavity, down through the trachea, the bronchus, the bronchial main stem, and into the lungs, all the way down to the alveoli, okay? Well, it makes sense that if you have some type of facial trauma, that's going to affect the integrity of the airway system, right? That affects how air gets in. So let's write chest trauma. I'll just write facial slash chest trauma. Well, if you have chest trauma, like a rib fracture, if that rib penetrates into lung tissue or to the pleural cavity, then you're going to end up with a pneumothorax, right? So we'll say pneumothorax. Blunt trauma. Penetrating trauma. And then if a client has anything in their airway, that is going to affect the integrity of the airway system. So let's think, what could actually be in the airway that's not supposed to be there? A foreign object, right? If somebody's choking. Sometimes certain types of cancers, um, the client will develop tumors in the airway system. That'll affect the integrity of the airway system. So we'll also put tumors, we'll put that over here. Now another thing that um, sometimes chronic illnesses can cause is an increase in respiratory secretions. That buildup of secretions can affect the integrity of the airway. So I'm gonna put secretions. All right, that's a lot, and that gives us a good start. Let's do the same thing with the properly functioning alveolar system. First of all, where is the alveolar system? Remember that's all the way down in the bases of the lungs where the alveolar are, that's where gas exchange takes place. Now those alveoli look like a little cluster of grapes or cluster of balloons, they inflate, okay? And they have to have patency in order for gas exchange to take place because gases cross that membrane, all right? What could affect the integrity of the alveolar system? Remember, they're way down here in the bases of the lungs, right? I'm going to put a word up here, and in the PowerPoint later on, I have that word listed. I want you to look that up so you understand what it is. And that word is atelectasis. Atelectasis. What else can be in the lungs that would prevent that gas exchange from taking place? Pneumonia. The client might have TB. Again, tumors could also develop that would affect the alveolar system. They could have a pleural effusion. I know there's a lot of these words that you may not be familiar with. This is a good opportunity for you to pull that dictionary up or even ask Google, what does this word mean?
Now, all of these things have one thing in common, atelectasis, plural effusion. Sometimes those two words are used interchangeably. Pneumonia, TB, tumors. They are going to, basically what it is like is that cluster of grapes, the alveoli, are almost underwater, if that makes sense. Now, that is a very loose interpretation, okay, um, because it is not typically that much fluid. But if they are in fluid or in mucus, if mucus is surrounding that alveoli, gas exchange can't take place, okay? Another disease process that's going to affect the alveolar system is called emphysema. Now, emphysema is one of the diseases of COPD, and emphysema looks like um, somebody who's got that big barrel chest. They're round. They cough a lot. They wheeze a lot. Um, it happens a lot with smokers. Now, what has happened in emphysema is they're able to get that air down in there, but then there's air trapping. They have a hard time getting it back out. So those little alveoli inflate, inflate, inflate until they pop just like a balloon. Well, when they pop, our, there's less surface area for gas exchange to take place because we want all those little cluster of grapes around every single alveoli, those veins and arteries are intertwined and that's where gas exchange takes place. So anything that decreases the surface area of the alveoli affects the integrity of that system, okay? Now, we've got to have a properly functioning cardiovascular hematologic system because your heart is the pump. The pump pumps oxygenated blood to the tissues. Your hematologic system carries the oxygenated blood to the tissues, so that's also important. What affects properly functioning CV and hematologic system? Any heart problem, that's your umbrella term, any heart disease, Remember when we did unit four and we talked about who was at risk for things? This person, if they have heart disease, they are at risk for an oxygenation issue, okay? Heart disease, like an MI, they've had a heart attack, congestive heart failure, I'm just gonna write CHF for room, okay? <clears throat> Valve problems. Now, hematologic makes me think about what? The blood, right? Who's got blood problems? Who can't, who doesn't have enough red blood cells to carry oxygen? Anemia. Low blood volume. and coagulation problems. I'm just gonna write coag, okay? Coagulation problems. Now, we've got several things listed here that can affect oxygenation. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go back in a different color and we're gonna think about each one of these issues and turn it around and ask what can the nurse do about this? What is the nurse's priority for a client that's experiencing this issue? Okay, so let's think about that. And I'm not gonna do each and every single one, but um, we'll do several of them together for you to get the idea of how I want you to continue with this assignment, okay? The integrity of the airway system, remember that's how air comes in. Let's say that the client has facial and chest trauma. Well, what are they gonna be doing? they've got facial trauma, they might have bleeding. So what's the nurse's priority? Clearing the airway, right? So it may be suctioning, it may be positioning the client. If they've got chest trauma, what are they gonna be doing? They're gonna be crunching down, holding that area because it hurts to take a nice, big, deep breath. If they're not taking big, deep breaths, as they're breathing way up here, just like that, is gas exchange taking place? No, because where does gas exchange occur? Way down deep in the alveoli, okay? So what's our priority? I'm just gonna say airway here. 
clearing the airway, suctioning the airway, positioning the client to clear the airway, okay? If they have some type of trauma, of course, we know this is not independent nursing interventions, right? You're going to be collaborating with a primary care provider. Um, you're going to be doing things like assisting with chest tubes, making sure they have that supplemental oxygen. I'm just going to put SUPP for supplemental O2, okay? Anytime somebody has lots of secretions, what do we need to do? Help them get rid of the secretions, right? That might be suctioning. That might be teaching them how to have an effective cough. Um, that might be assisting them with chest physiotherapy. Now, as you go down through the PowerPoint, I've got specific slides that talk about suctioning and chest physiotherapy, okay? Now, let's talk, talk about the next thing. Properly functioning alveolar system. This is where gas exchange takes place. In fact, what I'd like for you to do is when you see alveolar system, I want you to think gas exchange. All right, so what's the nurse's priority? Anytime somebody has impaired gas exchange, you wanna make sure they have adequate oxygen. So this person particularly, you're gonna make sure they have that supplemental oxygen. So I'm gonna put that right down here in the middle. Supplemental O2, okay? Now you guys, it is not our role to decide what method of oxygen delivery is going to be the best. We will collaborate with respiratory therapy. You'll collaborate with the primary healthcare provider. Um, but I do have slides later on in the PowerPoint that talk about oxygen delivery systems. So when a client has supplemental oxygen, we wanna make sure that it's being delivered accurately, okay? Atelectasis, pneumonia, pleural effusion. They have fluid building up in the lungs. So what do we need to do for that client? We need to manage their fluid intake, okay? They can't handle a whole lot of fluid intake. So we're gonna watch closely if they're getting IV fluids, I'm gonna say very slow. Y'all think about fluid and electrolytes. Remember who can't handle high flow um, IV fluid? Heart disease, kidney problems, the very old, the very young. And this person, if they are building up fluid in their lung tissue, they can't handle high flow. So I'm gonna put IV fluid, slow. I'm gonna just do IVF, that's IV fluid, slow. Okay, pneumonia. This person has lots of secretions built up, lots of mucus. Um, so we want to, now I know this sounds backwards because what I'm gonna say now is increase their fluid intake. Now don't get confused, okay? If they have a healthy heart, if they have healthy kidneys and they have developed pneumonia, they can handle increased fluid intake by mouth, okay? So with pneumonia, I'm gonna say increased fluid intake, all right? That fluid liquefies those secretions, so it makes that um, mucus easier to cough up, okay? If they have TB, what did we learn about TB? Especially with isolation precautions, right? All those isolation precautions. But how are we gonna help them with gas exchange. We're gonna do basic things like positioning. They need to be sitting straight up in bed, offer them supplemental oxygen, administer the medications that are prescribed. Same thing with the tumors, same thing with emphysema. I can't tell you how important this supplemental O2 is, okay? The whole problem with gas exchange problem is they're not exchanging the oxygen and carbon dioxide. So we've got to figure out a way to help them with that. All right, moving on. Properly functioning CV hematologic system. If a client is having an oxygenation issue because of these things right here, heart disease, MICHF, valve problems, independently, there's nothing we can do about that. We've gotta collaborate with the primary care provider and um, give the prescribed treatments, okay? So I'm just gonna do RX, that's for prescribed, okay? RX treatments. And guess what else? If somebody has anemia, one of the first things that we can do is give them oxygen. Okay. 
Okay, if they have decreased blood volume, they might be a candidate for a blood transfusion. If they've got coagulation problems and they're building up blood clots, we want to make sure they're on anticoagulation therapy, okay? All right, another thing that we can do, I know that looks like a lot of words, and we'll move out of the way so that you can see that and zoom in if you need to. This is basically a concept map, what we're building here, okay? We've got lots of thoughts going on, but if you use color, you'll be able to easily see red is the nurse's priority. Um, for integrity of the airway system and properly functioning alveolar system, those two things, you can also do something that I'm going to refer to as positioning. So I'm just going to write this right in here. Positioning. I want you to make sure you understand that that means straight in the bed, not slumped over, okay? Not chin to chest. You want their head up. Remember in CPR, what do we do to deliver breaths? Head tilt, chin lift, right? That opens up that airway. So positioning, have them sitting straight up in bed to um, ease the work of respirations. Um, and then I'm gonna write these letters right here for properly functioning alveolar system. T, C, D, B. That means turn, cough, deep, breathe. Turn, cough, deep breathe. Lots of times we'll have patients from surgery. When they come back, we'll say they've had some type of abdominal surgery. How are they gonna be breathing when they wake up and they're hurting? Really shallow, right? Way up here, because they don't wanna move the abdomen. It's gonna hurt. So we need to teach them how important it is to turn, cough, deep breathe to prevent the development of pneumonia because if they don't breathe deep, they're not gonna get that gas exchange going on and those secretions can settle, okay? So turn, cough, deep breathe is very important. Let's see, what is a lab value that we could assess for to know if our client needs supplemental oxygen? Do you remember? If they're anemic, hemoglobin, okay? I'm gonna put assess H G. B. That means hemoglobin. Um, and I'm going to put the numbers 12 to 17. Now, I'm not going to discriminate between male and female because there's a different value for each one. This is just a wide range, okay? 12 to 17. If that hemoglobin is less than 12, they are probably a candidate for supplemental oxygen. This is the person who's gonna have decreased activity tolerance. They're not gonna be able to get up and walk to the bathroom without getting short of breath, okay? Now for all of these folks, remember, you're gonna continue your adequate focused respiratory assessment. You're going to administer supplemental O2 and assess the proper functioning of that device, however it's being administered, okay? So this is a good start with thinking about what could cause a problem with oxygenation. All right, I'll talk to you guys later. What you want, what you want.